Praise the Lord, saints. Uh, we are continuing on with our series entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son. Uh, before we go into a word of prayer, uh, we have covered a variety of subtopics. Uh, first was that the younger son uh, leaves um, and how he not only left, but he went to a distant country far away from the influence of his father. Also continued on uh, dealing with the fact that he was deaf to his father's love. He was searching for things that he thought he would find, but they were actually unattainable. Also how he let others influence his departure. Then we went on and talked about the return of the younger son. Went on and talked about how he was initially lost to home <laughs> and also found out he was lost to his new friends, in quotes, when he ran out of all his wealth that he had squandered. Talked about the fact that he was fearful of being judged or rejected re returning home, and also dealing with the over overwhelming uh, sense of failure, you know, to come back so broken, you know, devastated, emaciated, um, ragged clothes and, and footwear. Uh, went on, uh, and oh yeah, we talked about the fact that he also remembered his sonship. Despite everything he encountered, there was a small part of him that still remembered that he was a child of his father. Uh, then we went to the fact that Jesus is the ultimate prodigal. Uh, last week, we started talking about the elder son and dealt with some of the um, aspects of Rembrandt's painting. Uh, we talked about some of the characteristics that we initially saw that um, there were some parallels between his story um, in the prodigal son as well as the story of the tax collector, um, the publican, and the Pharisee, and we pretty much left it at, at that with the, um, the cliffhanger for this week, that we're gonna start this week with the fact that the elder son leaves, amen? And I know I got a couple huh? <laughs> uh, reactions to that, but we're gonna continue with that. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. And right now, we thank you, Father, for uh, speaking to us powerfully through your word. We just praise you, Father, that over the last uh, month or so that we were able to glean a lot of insight that was beneficial and fruitful to our lives, that if there were some aspects in us relating to uh, the prodigal son or what we saw in the elders so far, that in the areas where we need to be refined, Reju reinvigorated, rejuvenated, um, cleansed, healed, delivered, that you would do that. And as we continue to focus on the other uh, characters of this story, the elder son and eventually the father, that you would continue to speak to our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So as I said last week, uh, not only did the prodigal son leave, which is something that is obvious to us, but I concluded uh, last week's sermon with the fact that this week we're going to look at the fact that the elder son leaves as well. And you might say, what are you talking about? Um, he was there the whole time with his father. But one of the things we have to keep in mind is that although the elder son remained physically, he had similarly abandoned his relationship with his father, in a sense, due to his attitude. So he was present physically, but there were emotional and spiritual aspects of him that had also departed. You know, one of the first things that we see in our text scripture is that although he didn't join his brother on that journey away from home, uh, that passage in Luke states in chapter 15, verse 12, it says that the father divided unto them his living. Uh-oh. You know, a lot of times we focus on the part that the younger son got his inheritance and it left. But it clearly says there that the elder, the father, divided unto them his living. So the older son remained, but he got paid too. Amen. And a lot of times we totally miss that. We think, oh, it's just the younger son got the money and left. But it clearly says there. Last time I checked, it says he divided unto them his living. 
So if you're so loving, you're so attached to your father, you're so appalled at the offense that the younger son had the audacity to do in saying, give me my inheritance, which once again is synonymous to that culture as in, I want your inheritance and I basically want you dead because that's the only way I can collect it. The elder son was disgusted his younger brother, but he took part in that offense by not refusing the division of the inheritance that also came to him. So it's nice to be all appalled, you know, to despise or reject or to point the finger at the other, at the other brother, but quite frankly, he took, a, he took advantage of the situation and he was able to collect a portion of the inheritance as well. You know, why didn't he say, Father, I refuse. There's no way I'm going to take part in that. You know, uh, I'm offended at the fact that you would think I would even want it, Father. No, it says he divided unto them his living, so he got part of that as well. And one of the things we also see is that when his brother returned, he didn't state that I love my father throughout all these years that have passed. Instead, he said, in the translation we use, that he had served him, but in the underlying Greek, it actually says he had been a slave to him all these years. Amen? So in other words, he had departed, and that's the first point we're going to look at today, he had made an emotional departure from being a son to being a slave of the father because of how he had worked over the years while his other brother was out there living, I guess, in the lap of luxury and pleasure. You know, let's look at the passage of scripture that comes to mind. And, you know, the funny thing is that um, we, we see the elder son and you know, we say, okay, he was a hard worker. He stayed there at the side of his father. But there's one thing to work closely as the son of the father. And there's another one that said, I was slaving away as if this had been forced upon me. And in a sense, you've abused me throughout all these years, making me work while he gets the bats and who knows what. So as I said, he had made emotional departure from being a son to a slave. And we might say, oh, well, he was just saying that out of his frustration. But as we know, how do you say something if there isn't some aspect of it, no matter how little that's embedded in your mind, your heart, your perceptions? So right, we could say, okay, his frustration, he said, I've been a slave to you. But quite frankly, how could that even come out of his mouth if there wasn't the littlest aspect in his perceptions that says, I'm being controlled, you know, I'm being oppressed, I'm being controlled and forced to do certain things that I don't want to do. And maybe you didn't bark orders at me, but the fact is I was doing stuff, you know, apparently that I didn't want to do, and I felt the pressure, you know, the weight of your influence that I have to do it even if I don't want to. So let's go over to Matthew chapter 20. And I'm going to read a pretty long passage, verses 1 through 16, but I think it really accentuates uh, some of the things that may have come to mind, not only to him, but as some of us have been in a place, whether we like it or not, of the older son, how we may have viewed people who have partaken of things that we might feel that they do not deserve. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he agreed with the labor laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. 
he saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when the evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. <laughs> The elder son, what hour did he come to the vineyard of his father? Was it in the first hour, the third hour, the sixth or the ninth? He surely wasn't part of the eleventh hour because the people that were members of the eleventh hour crew would not complain about getting a penny or a full day's labor when they came in at the conclusion of the day. So we know that the elder son obviously wasn't part of the 11th hour, and quite frankly, we can kind of surmise that it's unlikely that he was part of the ninth hour or maybe even the sixth hour. Why would you complain about getting a full day's pay when you came in at even the halfway point? You'd be in the mindset, let me keep my mouth shut before he changes his mind. <laughs> Man, I'm appreciative. A full day's labor, I mean earnings for half a day's work? Man, this guy ought to hire me every day. So it's most likely that the people were, that were initially there working all along diligently as we saw in the heat of the day, or even the people that were part of the second team of people joining the labor force, the third hour, those would be the ones that would say, hey, we worked through all this heat. And you know how hot it can get out there in the Middle East. It could be 100 degrees, it might be something you know, more, the sun beating down on you all day, you're getting baked, you're parched, your skin is dry and cracking. You're out there in the vineyard. You might be getting bit by insects and all these things. So, you know, we kind of see how uh, the people that worked all day diligently, you know, try to push themselves to make sure that they don't have any type of way that the owner of the field can say, you didn't work hard enough. I'm not getting you full pay. So these people are working. Amen. And the things they get for that is that they are fairly paid, the money's not held back, the, the owner doesn't say, come that back to me next week or next month and I'll finally have the funds available for you. No, he pays them that way, that day what they are due. The problem with them is he had the nerve to bring people on much, much later, especially those who were a part of the ninth hour and the eleventh hour. How dare you give them a full day's pay when I've been slaving here all along. This is unfair. This is unjust. How can you pay them the same thing I was paid when I should have earned much more or they deserve much little, littler, amen? And that's the mindset that the elder son had. I'm out here slaving all these years. He offended you, Father. He got his inheritance. Ixnay on the inheritance bay that I got. <laughs> Let's put that to the side. <laughs> He's out there partying and doing all these things. I'm working like a dog. Matter of fact, when I got the news of my brother being here, you know, it was because I'm out on the field working. I hear all this clamor and music and everything as I'm out here working like a dog and I hear that they're over there partying while I'm busting my hump. What are they partying about? And when he hears the news that they're celebrating 
killing fatty calves, playing music, dancing, smiling, laughing. I mean, it's like the Who's in Whoville, <laughs> you know, down there partying on Christmas Day. And the grinchy elder son says, why in the world are they celebrating something? And when he finds out who it is, he's basically of the mindset, I work these fields day after day after day. Matter of fact, the prodigal son didn't even come in at the ninth or 11th hour to work. He just showed up and got the paycheck. Putting out the stuff that I never got. That's unfair. And that's pretty much the mindset that the elder son had, you know, towards the celebration of his brother returning. Now, as we see here, the homeowner or the vineyard owner, he basically said, hey, what did I do wrong? You might not appreciate how I choose to distribute pay, but I'm the owner of all this stuff. I'm the one who hired people, and I have the right to pay people as I see fit. And how are you going to come to me and say that I've done wrong? Or maybe accuse me of being evil in how I distribute pay when I chose to be a blessing to people and say, hey, oh, just, it's been a great day out in the field. See, you see the little things, the particulars. You see what this person did versus that person. I showed up at this time. That person showed up at that time. Me as the owner, I'm seeing the big picture, and I say, hey, the work is completed. Let's all celebrate equally. But you're not the place that received that, and that's why you're disgruntled and even accusing me of doing something that is inappropriate. Once again, that's the mindset of the elder son. He didn't own the animal that was killed. He didn't own the place where everybody either worked or now was at the house celebrating the return of the prodigal son. So who was he to be in the place of saying, how dare you do this and do this over him when he departed? One of the things we gotta examine though is are we in the place of either the elder son or at times, are we in the place of the people that are working the fields, the vineyard, the corporation, the organization? You know, we, we worked in the, the church ministry, wherever it might be. You know, we're working hard and diligently. Maybe not necessarily in the literal heat of the day, but we're in the trenches. We dealt with the hardship. We may have come in at the initial stages where we're not even sure if this endeavor is going to be fruitful and then hear these stragglers come in the last minute that were sitting out there idle while we were working hard and they come in and they get all the credit along with us. How dare them get the accolades, the credit, the distribution of whatever the reward is. You know, how dare they be able to take a part of this? And even more so, if I'm not critical of them, judgmental of them or harsh, do I have the mindset that I want to go to the owner, the manager, the one who's in charge, Father God, and say, how dare you bless them when I've been slaving for X number of years in the trenches? Mm -hmm. And here they come along, and they're getting blessed equally to me. Father, I did street ministry. I was down under the Ben Franklin Bridge on the Camden side giving out food to the homeless in bleak circumstances where I'd endangered my life. Father, I was the one that got up in the middle of the night to go to the bedside of that person that's on his deathbed and lead him to salvation. Father, I'm the one that, when that person was dealing with sickness and disease, I had the faith and the trust in you go in there and not only minister to them in a the distance, but I threw my arms around them, kissed them on the cheek, laid hands on them and prayed without any fear that I would catch that sickness and disease. I was in the trenches in all the heats of the day that you put out there. But then you got the nerve, Father, that they've been saved 
2.5 seconds in comparison to how long I have slaved in that field. And they're getting exactly the same thing that I'm getting. How dare you, Father God, reward them like you reward me. Are we accusing Father God or people that God has placed in authority over us of being unfair? You know, are we going to them and saying, hey, why are you doing this so that either God himself or people in authority of us have to have the same response as verse 13? Friend, I do need no wrong. <laughs> Didn't you agree that this would be the benefits of your labor? You know? Take what's yours to go your way. Why are you sitting here criticizing me, debating me? And once again, is it lawful for you to tell me what to do, what is, with, what is my own and within my will? Do you have the right? Is it lawful for you to tell me how to distribute my wealth? You know, so we see that God's economy, the Father's economy, you know, is such that there's going to be some people that came in last, but yet they're going to get the same payment, distribution, blessings of those that came in much later. So I guess the lesson for us, whether we're the laborers out in the field that came in earlier, or if we're the elder son in a relationship. We can't sit there expecting that just because we work hard and long through dismal, heated, you know, uncertain circumstances that, you know, we might get extra brownie points and that, you know, they came in later and uh, they're not allowed to get the same benefit we do. There's gonna be times where, for whatever reason, and it's not for us to understand. Because as we see here, it's lawful for him to do what he wants with what he owns. So we just have to be in this place where we don't criticize, we don't question, and we don't challenge our Heavenly Father if he chooses to bless somebody at the same level. And here's the thing, how do we handle it? You know, I'm sure the people that came in late said, boy, I can't wait for him to hire me again. You know, I might seek him out. And who knows? Some of them that came in on the 11th hour and saw he paid a penny might be like, man, this guy is wonderful. Man, we were out here all day. As we saw here, we couldn't even be blamed because when he came up, it says, why are you guys sitting idle? They didn't say we're lazy bums, playing cards, checkers, and chess all day. I know it didn't exist then, but... They didn't say they were lazy. Their response was, nobody hired them. So maybe they were the hardest of workers. They just didn't have the opportunity. But those same people, come the next day, they might have been running to that vineyard. Man, I want to work for him again. And hey, if I got to work a full day, that's fine. He's a wonderful boss. I can't wait for another opportunity to work for him again. We gotta look at ourselves too. Are we sometimes eyeing people as the laborers on the field or the elder son? They didn't work as hard as me. Maybe they didn't get the opportunity. Do we have the right to say they're lazy? They cheated. They got the same benefits I did when I did all the work. Once again, maybe they just didn't get the opportunity. But we're the ones scrutinizing them from the perspective that they're lazy bums that sat back while I did all the main work. And oh, by the time they got here, you know, we built the house. We cleared the ground by cutting, the, cutting down the trees. We dug up the roots. We flattened the soil, got out the weeds. We got the hammers and nails and built the building. Did all these different things, put on the roof, the sidings, paint the inside walls. Oh, they put in a couple chairs. <laughs> once we're all done. You will pay them for building the house? <laughs> but that's how we look at it sometimes. And we got to be careful that we don't judge people falsely. So anyway, as I said, the elder son, unfortunately, and sometimes the laborers of the field had the mindset where they start to distance themselves. 
you know, and view the owner in a certain way. As we're going back to the prodigal son story, we see that uh, the circumstances of life took him from the place where before the departure and the distribution of the inheritance, he probably saw himself as, you know, only a son of the father. But after the prodigal son left, there's a gradual departure in his mindset. Here I am slaving away. You know, I, slur I slaved or served for you all these years. When did he allow himself to start viewing his father differently so that he lost his sonship and started seeing himself as nothing but a laborer or a slave? So there wasn't a physical departure, but there was an emotional and perceptual departure in the son. Second thing I'm going to look at today is we look at the return of the son and the elder son's attitude. He not only departed from sonship to the mindset of a slave or servant, he also, even though he was close to the father and saw how he was pining for his brother, when he saw the joy that was expressed by the father at the return of his brother, he unfortunately got himself in a position where he was abstaining from the father's joy. And that's our second point for today. Abstaining from the father's joy. You can be close to the father, in other words, but are you joyous about the things that the father is joyous about? So we're going to go to a passage that I don't think is by coincidence actually occurs right before our text scripture. And I think it's actually leading up to the prodigal son story. So we're going to go to the beginning of Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. And it actually starts to set the stage of leading into the prodigal son story. Uh, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmur, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You know, look at the heart of this story. And it really has the story of the prodigal son, which comes later in that chapter, written all over. It, I mean, it really just has the essence of it. Because as we see here, you know, if a man has a hundred sheep and lose one of them, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine to go after that which is lost until he find it? You know, the 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 father in the prodigal son's story didn't go out searching all over the world to find his son, but we can say in a certain sense that his heart, pining for the return of the son, was looking for the one that was lost over the one, the elder son, that remained there. His heart was still pining for the one that had ventured off into the wilderness. As we see here, he was not going to be at rest and a place of total peace and comfort until he had found the one sheep, the younger son, that was lost out in the wilderness. And we see further on, you know, I think it's so eloquently portrayed in Rembrandt's uh, painting. You know, when he finds it, he lays this on his shoulders. You know, we had to picture the shepherd picking up the sheep and putting it over his shoulders. You know, there's a few reasons there. One, I'm carrying you and make sure you don't run off again, so I'm going to carry you back to the sheepfold. Number two, as you're attached to me, you're going to be smelling me and reacquainting yourself with the shepherd. You know, one of the reasons why you may have departed is because I had the hundred sheep in the sheepfold. You know, maybe you were over there, over there. You didn't spend enough time close to me, and you lost 
you know, my sin. So I'm going to reassemble you into, you know, being part of my sheepfold by holding you close so you can get the smell. And in Rembrandt's painting, you know, the father, being of age, does not lay his son over his shoulders and, you know, carry him home. But we see upon him getting there, he's on his knees and the father takes his arms and he embraces him so that his, you know, within the boundaries of his shoulders. Uh, then we see that, you know, once he comes home, what does he do? Calls other people and says, hey, kill the fatted calf. Rejoice with me. The one sheep that is lost has now been found. We see it wasn't a sheep. Well, it was a human sheep <laughs> that was lost. And now the father immediately has a reaction. Now that the lost sheep has returned, I want everybody to rejoice with me. And we see here that even though we may not necessarily understand, and some people might say, oh, you lost appreciation for the 99 that stayed at your side and within the sheepfold. It's not a case of that. It's a case that the good shepherd knows that, you know, I appreciate and I love those 99 that remain, but I have a heart for the one that is broken and lost and this distance, the distance him or herself. So I am going to celebrate and rejoice and call everybody to be a part of the celebration when the lost sheep returns. And that's the heart that the father had. You know, when somebody returns that is lost, I want everybody who has my heart and my mindset, who is closely as associated with me in my sheepfold, you know, they hear my voice, they know my scent, they know my heart and character. I want them to all, you know, have the same mindset of me. With that proximity should be a closeness not, closeness not only in your distance, it should also be a closeness of how my heart operates and what I long for. So it should not be shocking to you that when one lost sheep returns, instead of me being judgmental or having you judgmental, I want to rejoice and hey, we're all family, I want us all to rejoice together. And that's the mindset that the father had over the return over the son. All of you should have been pining for the sheep that was lost. All of you should be ready to celebrate when the lost sheep finally returns to the sheepfold. And that's why it was sad and we can say that the elder son was abstaining or had departed from the, the love of the father, the pining for the return of the lost sheep or the lost prodigal. And he was especially departed from or abstaining from the joy that the father experienced upon the return of the brother. Amen. You know, it's a sad thing. Uh, he gets the news. You know, it's one thing when he doesn't know what's going on. But when he gets the news that his younger brother, the prodigal, or the lost sheep have returned, he should have been filled with joy as well. Instead, it angered him. It made him feel resentful. So he was close to his father, but he was far from his father in terms of having the joy that he should have had upon the return of his brother. And that's actually our next point. He not only abstained from the joy of the father, he distanced his heart from the fathers. Amen? That's another form of departure. He distanced his heart from the father. And we're going to go over to Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark, chapter 7 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 16 praise the Lord then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups 
and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You know, unfortunately, the elder son had what we could pretty much say was a pharisaical or pharisaical relationship with his father. You know, as we look at his reaction, you know, I have served or slaved for you all these years. You know, you might say, hey, the work was hard, father, but I've been a slave to you all these years. That's a whole nother thing. A departure from, you know, the love um, that he should have had and the love that he should have known his father had for him. You know, it was just as hurtful to the father to hear that one son left me because he wished me dead and asked for the inheritance. Now I'm talking to you in the midst of trying to celebrate the return of your brother and I find out you thought I considered you to be like a slave all these years? You know, hurt part two. <laughs> Don't I have enough of this? Can I enjoy the return of your broken down heart, broken brother? And now I hear that, you know, you perceive yourself to be a slave to me all these years when I only saw you as a son. So he had a pharisaical relationship with father. And by that, I mean, he was focused on manual labor so much. You know, what his brother had done and even being critical of the father's reaction to the return of his brother. He wasn't seeing himself in the place of a son, nor did he have the heart of his father. You know, instead of resenting the return of his brother and questioning why his father was rejoicing, his initial thought actually should have been, my goodness, all the years of our loving father's presence that my brother has missed. Man, he's missed so many things. So many things that God, that my father has told me that, you know, he didn't get the opportunity to hear. Oh, it's so sad, all the things that he missed during the years of his departure. You know, he should have also had the, the mindset that, man, I had all this quality time with dad to learn all these different things. You know, and boy, it's going to take a while for you know, father or me to be able to instill those things, you know, the wealth of knowledge that I've gleaned over the years from father that he missed out on. That's a tragedy that makes me sad, but he did not have that mindset towards his brother. Nor did he have the mindset of the father, you know, from a brotherly perspective. Thank God that my brother has returned. But oh my goodness, he looks so broken. We must do everything we can to try to restore him as quickly as possible. We need to give him food to build up his strength. We need to give him good clothes and get him out of those rags. You know, look at how horrible. You know, what in the world did my brother deal with? That's the type of mindset that the elder brother should have had towards his younger brother, but as we see, he was close to his father, but he did not learn, you know, the heart of the father. He learned how to work the field. And he even did that in a resentful manner. So he did not have the heart of the father and if anything had distanced himself from the heart of the father. So as I said last week, the younger son had to get deliverance from being out there in the world. You know, he needed mind, body, and spirit deliverance and restoration from his brokenness. To a certain extent, the elder son similarly needed emotional and spiritual deliverance and restoration. His body was whole, but his mind, his heart, and his attitude surely weren't. So the father might have said, I got one son to bring back the wholeness. And based upon the reaction of the elder son, he found out, ooh, I got a problem here. I got two sons to rebuild, to repair, to bring the wholeness. You know, that pretty much gets us to our next point. Not only had he distanced his heart, 
abstained from the father's joy and departed from sonship to a mindset of slavery, but he was also lost in a place of resentment. He had transitioned to the place of resentment. Praise the Lord. Now we'll go to Hebrews chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, 12 through 15. Hebrews 12, 12 through 15. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So we see here, follow peace with all men. And that's all men. <laughs> you know, not just the ones you choose to be peaceful with. Yes, you had a situation training uh, over the last week or so, and it's among teenagers, and I try to kind of tweak them in the right direction because there was one teenager that was at odds with another teenager, and it was visible in a person's face and, and in an interaction with this other person. And the funny thing is that sometimes discerning teenagers can even see the right thing. And they asked the one, like, why are you offended and mad at that one? And the person said, why? And the other teenager said, well, I did the same exact thing to you. So why are you okay with me? Smiling, happy, everything's cool. He did the same exact thing, and you're, you're angry with him. What kind of sense does that make? I was like, thank you. <laughs> so I said, hey, high five, hug it out, move on. I don't know if they did, but, you know, it just shows you that a teenager got it. We could choose those who we want to be at peace with and those we want to reconcile with. Um, and as we see here, the elder son chose, because that's what it is, the elder son chose not to follow peace with his younger brother. And by that, a lot of times when you choose to have that attitude towards one person, later on, it serves as a stepping stone to you not being at peace with other people. And you might think like, oh, well, I got all against that person and that person alone, and you know, I'm just going to keep them in my sights, and they better not say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, or that's it. But I'm cool with everybody else. But look how quickly the elder son transitioned. I got beef with my younger brother, which is probably part of him departing in the, in the first place. And as he's gone all these years, I'm retaining a, built, a beef and it's building up higher and higher to the point of resentment where look at all this work I have to do because he's not here to do his part. And even though I think I just got a beef with him, now I'm building a beef with dad because all these years I'm slaving over you doing all this work. That's totally unfair to me. And then when we get the news of the prodigal son returning and the father's um, rejoicing, then he has a further beef now fully exhibited with the father. How are you going to have peace with him when he took inheritance, squandered it, has the nerve to come back, and you're throwing a party to celebrate? So he probably thought the beef was just with his younger brother, but it actually had built up to the point that now the beef on one person has transferred or traveled over to somebody else. And even worse, it was something that built up within him and it caused him to be defiled in his heart, character, and his perceptions. Because as we saw, he saw himself not as a son, he saw himself as a slave. And yeah, we're not gonna go to the stream and say, oh, he forgot that he was part of the you know, DNA or the biological lineage of the father. Of course he knew he was a son. But he still said, oh, I'm working out here like a slave. There was a part of resentment there. And that's why you see 
If you don't follow peace with all men, you might think you got under control, but it could travel to people that you would never think you'd have a beef with. If you asked him earlier on, could you ever disrespect your father? No, I'll never be like my brother. Did you hear what he did? He hurt my father to the core. I could never do the things that he did to my father. Next thing you know, why are you celebrating him? Why are you killing animals and, and rejoicing over him? Sound kind of mouthy to me. <laughs> That's why we're warned here. Follow peace with all men. <laughs> and it tells us, if your hands are hanging down, you know, your shoulders drooping, your knees are wobbling, it tells you, do the work to make your path straight, to take away the lameness that's inside of you. It doesn't tell us that we have to necessarily have somebody else do it, even though, you know, wise counseling um, and loving support and guidance to remove bitterness in your heart is good, but God is basically telling us as well that we have the capability to self-heal and discipline ourselves and purge ourselves of these roots of bitterness before they can take hold of us. You know, um, in his case, he chose not to deal with the situation right. You know, he allowed the root of bitterness to take a hold on there, or upon him. And as we see with any plant, you know, it goes back to the principle of the seed that we see in the book of Genesis. You know, that, that seed principle travels cover to cover. It goes not only through the plant life, animal life, but even human life, the principle of the seed. And it's not even just a physical seed being planted, but spiritual and emotional seeds, all the things relating to seeds produce after their own kind. Amen? So you put an apple seed in the ground, you don't expect orange, right. oranges to come up. Amen? Amen. You, you plant cabbage, lettuce, whatever it is. When you put those seeds in the ground, you water them, fertilize them, do the weeding and everything, you expect to produce a, wheat, a plant after its own kind. You know, unfortunately, I don't know why some people say, okay, I'll allow seeds of resentment to get planted in my mind and heart, and I'm just going to be this joyous, peaceful person. No, you allow that seed to grow, it's going to produce after its own kind. And one of the things that also needs to be known about seeds Seeds not only re reproduce after their own kind, but they produce exponentially after their own kind. You can plant one seed, that thing can produce multiple plants. You know, we have an arrow garden at home. You know, I, I plant, man, drop a basil seed, I put a basil pot in there, that basil pod with seeds will grow up and it'll kill all the other plants around it because it grows so fast. You know, talk about producing after its own kind. You've done it with tomatoes and, and, and peppers, and, you know, and it gets to the point where stuff is growing so quick just from that little tiny pod that you can't believe how much offspring or produce comes out of that one thing that got planted. Now, parallel that with emotional seeds that get planted that are ungodly. Those things are going to produce after their own kind. They're going to explode. They're going to produce a harvest that might be beyond anything that you can even imagine. And that's why God warns us in the beginning. Do your weeding and, if necessary, uprooting of plants and roots before they can spring up to trouble you. And not only that, it says it not only troubles you, but then it goes on and says, and thereby many be defiled. You plant, you know, poison oak in your mental, spiritual field, that's you know somebody else has poison oak. <laughs> We're seeing the spread of stuff with the coronavirus right now. You know, a few people get it, and that's you know, you know, they're looking at, hey, could this be a pandemic? It started out with a few people. Uncontained, not nipped in the bud. Now the whole world is like, uh-oh, let's be on the alert. Because it wasn't contained at the point of origin. And that's why it's so critical for us. And we saw in the case of the elder son, he did not contain the toxicity 
at the point of orig origin when it first manifested itself. And because of that, he had years and years of it building up to the full point that now he is, as I said last week, going from the place of being the elder son to now transitioning over to being a prodigal son himself. Physically available, but emotionally and spiritually removed and at a distance from his father. We got to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to do that as well. Um, you go to Genesis 4. We see what the word of God tells us about that as well. Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 8. And we actually see one of the first cases of a building of resentment and being lost from love. Genesis 4, 1 through 8, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So we can sometimes be lost in resentment, and as we see in this story, you don't even know what your capabilities can be as a result of that resentment building up. And one of the things we clearly see in this story is that God himself can even intervene and tell you like, hey, you got a problem stirring up there. You need to stop it before it builds up to the point where there's grievous you know, repercussions. And you end up doing something that is appalling you know, and, and extremely um, ungodly. He tried to warn him and uh, unfortunately he did not heed the warning of the Lord. It's one thing to self-police and say, hey, I think I'm getting an attitude. I need to watch myself. <laughs> but it's quite another thing when God himself is speaking to you, you know, through the word, through a still small voice, you know, through the Holy Spirit, uh, through a dream, whatever. God is speaking to you and telling you, like, warning Will Robinson, danger, danger. And you don't heed the warning. As we see here, sometimes we can try to even deny where we are emotionally and spiritually or what we're capable of doing, and we end up doing exactly the thing that we were warned about. Amen? It's such a sad thing. God tried to warn him. He probably said, no, I, can never, I can never do anything horrible to anybody. I'm under control. I'm, you know, I was a little disappointed, but I'm not walking around wroth and my countless falling all the time. I'm good. I'm good. Next thing you know, he's committing the first murder. Amen? And then the crazy thing is the very thing that he did, he's afraid what's going to happen to him. Oh, you sent me away, Lord. Somebody's going to come and kill me. Oh, well, isn't that ironic? <laughs> You're worried about being killed after you killed somebody. Um, yeah, unfortunately for him, God marked him. But uh, the, the main point, though, is that he was lost in his situation from being in acceptance with God. And God had even shown him the proper way to reconcile the situation of being right, right standing. He refused to do it and ended up committing a heinous act. Um, I'm sure being in the presence of his father that the elder son, there must have been something in those conversations or just um, gleaning the values 
of his father over the years and seeing the heart that he had for people, that those qualities should have been instilled in him, but yet somehow he either ignored them or he was lost to them because of his resentment that continued to grow over working the fields and taking on, I guess, two sets of responsibilities, his own as well as his brothers, as opposed to um, allowing his heart to remain pure and to have the same mindset as his father. So he ended up, you know, being in a place where, unfortunately, he ended up having that attitude and he couldn't even hide the fact that he was disgruntled about the return of his brother. And the thing we got to see there is that you cannot permit the imperfections, the attitudes, the shortcomings of other people to get you to the place where you're lost in resentment or you become hard-hearted, resentful, judgmental. You especially got to be careful that when the Lord's trying to warn you or people that he's made wise and godly counselors over your life, if they try to you know, give you warnings like, hey, you know, I, I need a discern that your countenance is falling when they mention that person or in this situation you seem to get edgy. You know, we got to be careful that we're not ignoring the warnings, whatever the way, way the Lord tries to present them to us, that we don't ignore those warnings. In Cain's situation, he refused to heed the warning he was given from God himself. And then we see, you know, what happened. So we got to make sure we don't join that company. Um, let's do uh, one more uh, on this subtopic. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but thou considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Praise the Lord. So we see here that sometimes when we allow resentment to come in, you know, have the mindset, you know, as we saw in the, in the portrait of the elder brother standing at a distance, looking onto his brother, probably with an attitude of content or disgust, you know, look at him. You know, he ate the air of his ways and you know, not having that, that that heart of the father to, yeah, he made mistakes, but let me bring him back in and, and restore him. You know, we had the mindset that, oh, look at him and, you know, look at he did with himself and he deserved it. And we're sitting there judging, you know, God's mindset. And even here in the word, words of Jesus, we see you better be watchful of how you judge people because at the same level you judge, you know, you'll also be judged. You know, and also, you know, looking at ourselves honestly, how are you going to say to that person, get a moat, you know, a speck out of your eye when you got a two by four beam inside of your own eye? You know, we better be careful if uh, we're picking somebody else apart, whether we have things that are even larger that can be picked out of our own lives. You know, I remember a situation years ago, I'm not going to mention the person, but a person's uh, radio host was really critical of somebody. Um, picking them apart, stuff like that, questioning his intelligence. And shortly after that, it was exposed that he had a, dr had a drug problem. You know, it's, it's funny, we gotta be careful. Like, you will judge somebody else, you might have the stuff coming back your way, even heavily. So, um, we had the warning there. Don't be a hypocrite, don't judge people. Uh, the elder brother was judging his brother as unappreciative, uh, greedy, lustful, uh, evil and wanting the inheritance and basically um, making a statement that I wish for the death of my father to get what's mine. He's judging his brother, but you didn't judge the fact that you're resentful and angry and bitter and resentful. 
and also insubordinate to your father. And you may not have manifested it yet, but the fact is it was all in you. And when the time presented itself, you showed exactly who you were. So the brother probably had a thousand things, a book or journal that he could have written about his brother and all his you know, poor qualities. Make sure you save a couple of chapters for yourself if you're going to have that type of, of mindset. Our last subtopic we're going to look at for today is that uh, the elder son had not only departed from sonship to being a slave, abstained from the father's joy, um, was lost in resentment, and a distance his heart from his father. But the final point for today is that he was also lost to himself. Lost to himself. He probably didn't know what was inside of him until it got exposed. Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Look at that. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's a passage of scripture where it talks about having a, a double, being a double-hearted person. Amen. You can think like, oh, I feel this way. I'm only capable of this or that. When the circumstances um, come, you can show another side of yourself. It talks about out of a double heart, somebody being able to speak. Well, I can never be that mean-spirited. Okay, let something happen. We'll see. We'll see exactly what you're made of. It, it's good. It's, it's so easy to be good and honorable without reproach when everything is going smooth. You know, a lot of people tell you that the true um, way of, of seeing who a person is is when they're dealing with trauma, chaos, unexpected things that come their way, hardships that are unexpected, um, situations where they have a choice of standing true to their espoused values or compromising themselves to make the road a little easier. You, you see the true measure of a person, you know, when they're faced with hard circumstances. You know, do you truly believe what you profess? You know, we could all say, I, 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 I trust God with all my heart. Get a major disease and see how much you trust God. You know, I trust God. You know, I, I pay my tithes every week and contributions. Deal with financial hardship. We'll see how much you believe in tithes and offerings. It's easy when, you know, you make a lot of money to say, I believe in that. It's easy when you're healthy to say, I believe in God healing. When you need healing, and it's major, we're going to find out how much you trust in God. And I'm not saying don't get surgery, don't get medication. I'm saying who do you trust more when a health crisis comes your way? Amen? That's the true test of what you stand for. And as we see here, you know, going back to this passage, it says the heart is deceitful above all things. Notice that. More deceitful than, you know, your professed beliefs, your mind, your attitude, your conduct. It says your heart is deceitful above all those other things that are associated with your life. And then it goes further. It says it's desperately wicked, and who can know it? <laughs> That's basically telling us we don't know what we're made of all the time. You know, perfect example I'm thinking of is, is Peter. You know, Jesus is ministering and preaching and teaching them, and he talks about what is to come, and, and Peter's like, I'll never betray you. Never. You know, if you're going to death, I'm going with you, Lord. I got your back. I'm your homie. <laughs> Jesus looks at him. Man, you'll sell me out three nights before, before the rooster crows. Never. <laughs> I'll never tell you out. Next thing you know, he's in tears after he sells about three times exactly as the Lord told him. Amen? He didn't know he was getting a prophetic word uh, when he got that. But if you ask him, and as he professed, I'll never betray you, I'll never sell you out. That shows you there's a side of him that he didn't know existed. He never knew that the sellout Peter was in there. 
It's like ragu is in there. Where's a prayer? One of them. <laughs> he didn't know that was in there. He thought, I'm full of courage and boldness. And I'm standing at your side in all things. And here's the thing, the quiet one. John the Beloved, Peter's up there, I'll never betray you. John's sitting there quiet, doesn't say a thing. Who's at his side throughout the whole process? Who takes over sonship to the mother? The quiet one. <laughs> that goes to show you, sometimes the ones with the biggest mouths are the ones that will push the eject button the quickest. <laughs> so bravado, bravado means nothing. You know, and sometimes we can deceive ourselves. And you know, like I said, the, the, the elder son probably thought, I'm always a loving son. I'm always a devoted son. I'll never leave my father's side. Oh, I am exactly like my father. I'm loving and I'm honorable. I'm all these different things. And he found out he didn't know his true heart. You know, when all these vile things started coming out of him. And matter of fact, when he starts questioning and disrespecting his father, he probably would have told people, I would never disrespect my father like my brother did. And yet, he did it right to his face, just like his brother did. It might have been a different approach and a different reason, but he did exactly the same type of insubordination to his father's face that his younger brother had done. So we had to be careful, too, that um, we don't become lost to the father and um, deceive ourselves like oh I'm never capable of doing this Lord you know we don't know what we're capable of doing because we haven't faced every single situation and scenario that's possible under the sun all we can do is trust the Lord and as we see here I the Lord searched the heart I tried the reins when he's talking about trying the reins that's similar to a rider on top of the horse what they'll do a lot of times before they go out and embark on a journey they attack, they put on the saddle, they attach the reins, and they'll tug on them, okay, is this secure? You know, did I put it on here right? You know, is the leather okay? Is it, you know, is it worn? I need to put on another set? Let me try the reins. Then you'll start off on a journey on the horse, and like, all right, let me tug it a little bit, slow them down. You know, give a little snap and speed them up. Pull left, pull right. All right, the reins are working. Okay, we can go further out on our complete journey. The Lord tries the reins of our heart. You know, we're going in a certain direction. They're going too fast. Let me see if they'll slow down if I give it a little tug. Or go left or right. Uh-oh. We got a wild mare here. A wild stallion. This horse is not doing what I'm telling it to do. And the Lord searches the heart, so he'll try to point us in the right direction. If he sees that we have the capacity to get off the trail or to buck like a horse against his, lead, his leadership, the Lord will try to pull on the reins to get us back in the right direction and to teach us how to journey properly. Unfortunately, the elder son's heart, he was deceiving himself and he didn't see that he was, uh, could be as offensive to the father as his brother was. And that's exactly why it set the stage that after years of bitterness, he was lost to himself as much as he started to be lost to the love and the character of the father to the point that it exploded. You know, he really didn't even know what he was capable of doing. So in order to ensure that we don't become like him, we need to ask God to reveal the truth about ourselves, um, which sometimes we are incapable of discerning due to the heart being self-deceptive. You know, we can fool ourselves. We're going to do two more passages of scripture and we'll be done today. Still talk about being lost to ourselves. Uh, psalm chapter 26 verses 1 and 2. A psalm of David. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So we see this passage is pretty closely related to the previous one. You know, the, the other one says, I the Lord search the heart and I try the reins. You know, and basically the heart is deceitful. In this one, David is saying, hey, I'm trying my best to walk in what I view as being integral, but I ask you to judge me. He's saying, God, I'm asking you to search the heart. And then, so that I don't slide, 
I want you not only to search my heart and judge it whether or not I'm seeing myself correctly, but also I want you to prove me by trying the reins in my heart to make sure I don't get off the beaten path. So the Jeremiah passage is saying, here's what I, the Lord, do. I judge and try and try your reins and I search your heart. In this passage in the Psalms, David is reversing that, saying, I'm asking you to do that process. You know, I'm not waiting for you to get around to it. <laughs> hey, Lord, open, open heart, open mind, open spirit. I'm asking you to do the searching and discerning and the trying of my reins in my heart. Because, you know, I'm doing my best, as, as it says here, to walk in my t integrity. But I know I've made mistakes in the past. I'm trying to avoid them in the future. I'm trying not to be lost to the reality of who I am. So I ask you to test me to see, when I say I'm integral, in, integral am I correct in my self-evaluation? You be the final judge to tell me if I'm correct. And if I'm not, steer me back in the right direction as you try my reins and my heart. And then the final one, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, goes one more step further. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any way, wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David goes a step further. He says, hey, you know, search me, Lord. Know my heart. But see, you know what, Lord? I want you to go a step further. Not only try my reins and try my heart, I want you to take it a step further and also examine my thoughts. Go in there and make sure not only do I not have something buried deep in my heart, which could lead me astray, but even in my thought life, you know, my, the way in which I perceive stuff. Analyze those as well and make sure that there's nothing wicked in me. And if you find that there is something errant, Lord, I ask you to reveal it to me and then lead me in the way everlasting so that I don't make a mess of my life, <laughs> you know, as I've done in the past. So David is trying not to be lost to the reality of what his capabilities are and the ways in which he might err in terms of his judgment, his mindset, and his heart towards things. You know, that's something that the elder son failed to do. Um, but it's also something that we fail to do from time to time. So that's the remedy and the solution when we can even be lost to ourselves. You know, don't trust in yourself, but ask God to take a hold on that process. Let him do the evaluations. And that way, we can say that, hey, not only am I closely attached to God and remaining in the sheepfold, but I'm trying to assure that I'm not in the sheepfold but I'm actually at a far distance because I'm, in the, I'm present physically, but in my heart, mind, emotions, and attitude, I'm at a far distance from you. I want you to ensure, God, that I'm close, mind, body, and spirit, and everything is unified with you in terms of my conduct, how I perceive things, and especially how I have uh, compassion for those who may still be prodigals. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And we'll uh, close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. And right now, we thank you, Father, for the peace that you pour out upon us. We thank you, Father, that you saw fit to have us examine uh, the story of the prodigal son and father even as um, you place upon my heart there's times where we have aspects of the prodigal there's times that we have aspects of the elder son and hopefully we all get to the place where we primarily live according to the conduct of the father I just praise you right now father that there's anything in us that uh, relates to the negative aspects of the younger son and the elder son, that you would reveal it to us, that you would show us how to 
uh, be purged of it. That even as we saw in our last couple of passages, you would try our reins, that you would search our hearts and our minds, and you would lead us in the way that is everlasting. And we praise you, Father, for this. We thank you, Father, that um, there might be people in our lives that are wayward, prodigals, troubled, unsaved, uh, walking in errant ways at a distance from you, Father, but instead of us being judgmental, let us have the heart like you that you long for the return and the restoration, and let us be a part of it as opposed to being somebody who behaves like the elder son. And we just give you the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for these things that whether we're ministering to somebody that is a prodigal, somebody is just returning, or once again, if we're coming out of the process of being in one of those stages that your love would resonate in us and through us, you would bring us to wholeness and healing, and that for those that we minister to, we would do the same in them. And we give the praise, the honor, and the glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.